Welcome to Context. This is Brad Harris. I'm thrilled to be releasing this first episode of the new podcast. If this is your first encounter with me, I should mention that I have another podcast called How It Began: A History of the Modern World, and I hold a PhD in the history of science and technology from Stanford University. In this show, Context, we'll be exploring how other scholars have developed their insights on the rise of the modern world. There are countless great books on this subject, but most people simply don't have time to read them. Here, I aim to distill the wisdom from those works for you and contextualize the author's arguments. We all want to navigate toward greater prosperity, and we can argue over politics and values all day in the effort. But unless we understand our historical context, our discourse will be bloated with bad assumptions, and progress will stall. We owe it to our future to be better historians. I hope context helps us toward that end. Today, we're considering the book *Guns, Germs, and Steel: The Fates of Human Societies* by Jared Diamond. *Guns, Germs, and Steel* was published in 1997. It won the Pulitzer Prize for General Nonfiction in 1998, along with the Aventis Prize for Best Science Book and several other awards. It was a highly acclaimed book, and even though it's now 20 years old, it still offers unique insight on why the modern world looks the way it does. Jared Diamond has also written several other famous books, two of which are among my favorites: *The Third Chimpanzee*, published in 1991, along with *Collapse: How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed*, published in 2005. Jared Diamond will be 81 years old this year. I consider him to be among the biggest and clearest thinkers of our time. He asks audacious historical questions, and I don't agree with everything he argues, but I think his work is invaluable. The fundamental question that Jared Diamond seeks to answer through this book, *Guns, Germs, and Steel*, is. Why did history unfold so differently on different continents, such that Eurasians succeeded in developing the power to conquer people around the world, rather than the other way around? Why didn't Native Americans, for example, develop advanced technology and build ocean-going ships and colonize Europe or China? What caused Eurasian societies to become so disproportionately influential in creating the modern world? It's important to know the term Eurasia. It's an amalgam of Europe and Asia. Diamond interprets that entire landmass as a single unit throughout his book, which is problematic for certain reasons we'll discuss later on. Now, in the past, a lot of people ignorantly assumed that Eurasians rose to global domination because they were somehow inherently superior. We know that's bogus, and Diamond is particularly convinced, given his extensive fieldwork with native New Guinean tribes people, that so-called primitive peoples who still live semi-hunter-gatherer lifestyles are at least as smart as people living in advanced economies. He actually argues that New Guineans might even be smarter, since he assumes they have so many more problems to solve day to day just to survive than typical New Yorkers or Londoners say, who are raised, as he says, watching television and have all their needs met automatically. I'm not so sure about that. I think he's overlooking the tremendous complexity of life in developed economies and the countless novel challenges confronting human beings in modern life. But Diamond's argument really isn't racial whatsoever. I think he's just overcompensating a little here. Ultimately, he explicitly assumes that intelligence is not the important historical variable that enabled Eurasian societies to overwhelm other societies. So, what is the answer? Well, the title of the book is actually a little misleading here. Guns, germs, and steel certainly empowered Eurasians to subdue people all over the world during the past 500 years or so. But why were Eurasians the ones wielding those weapons in the first place, instead of the people they conquered? Let's consider one of the most shocking examples in his book of the disparity in power between Eurasians and non-Eurasians. 
On November 16, 1532, a mere 168 ragged Spanish soldiers, led by Francisco Pizarro, thousands of miles from their home, found themselves in the Peruvian highlands of South America, facing an Incan army numbering 80,000. The meeting was supposed to be peaceful, but when the Incan emperor, Atahualpa, shunned the Spanish priest and threw the Bible he'd been offered to the ground, the Spaniards became enraged and attacked. Within a few hours, those 168 Spaniards had slaughtered at least 7,000 Incan soldiers without losing one of their own. They'd sent the rest of that massive army fleeing, they'd captured the Incan emperor, and over the course of the following few years, they completely destroyed Incan civilization. Lots of things went wrong for the Inca. They were politically divided when the Spaniards showed up, they were completely caught off guard by Spanish aggression, but it's clear that the Spaniards just dominated the fight, even though the odds were like 476 to 1 against them. Obviously, the Spaniards had better weapons. They had some guns with them for sure, but the, really the only important gun was a single artillery piece. The rest were what are known as harquebuses, really slow to load, really inaccurate first-generation guns, whose effect was mostly psychological. The Inca were terrified by their explosions. The weapon that mattered for the Spaniards was their steel. Their steel swords, daggers, and lances, and their steel armor. Against steel, the Inca were impotent. They had only thin thatch and leather armor through which steel blades sliced easily, and their blunt club weapons just bounced off Spanish steel armor. Spanish horses were decisive as well. There were around 30 mounted Spanish soldiers against whom the Inca had absolutely no defense. They couldn't even retreat since they couldn't outrun them. And horses, like guns, terrified the Inca, who'd never seen anything like them. Now, as for Eurasian germs, they came into play earlier. The reason why the Inca were politically divided when the Spaniards showed up was that a smallpox epidemic had already spread among South American natives after being introduced by Spanish settlers in Panama and Colombia six or seven years earlier. Countless Inca had fallen ill and died, including the original emperor and most of his court, setting off a full-scale Incan civil war. Overall, then, it's fair to say that the Inca were already far from the top of their game in the moment when they faced off against the Spaniards, and the Spanish guns, germs, and steel utterly demolished what was left of them. So it's clear in that particular fight why the Spanish won. But that doesn't answer Diamond's question. He wants to know why the Spanish had the guns, germs, and steel, and why the Inca didn't. He wants to know what happened further back in history to cause the Incan civilization, along with nearly all other native societies around the world, to be at such a disadvantage when they collided with Eurasian civilization. For Diamond, the answer is entirely environmental and can be traced all the way back to the emergence of settled agriculture 13,000 years ago. By then, the last ice age had ended, humans had spread over most of the globe, and we were in the process of populating North and South America. At that time, world population was only a few million, and we all still lived like hunter-gatherers. In the 13,000 years since the end of the last ice age, Diamond writes, quote, some parts of the world developed literate industrial societies with metal tools. Other parts developed only non-literate farming societies, and still others retained societies of hunter-gatherers with stone tools. Those historical inequalities have cast long shadows on the modern world because the literate societies with metal tools have conquered or exterminated the other societies and history followed different courses for different peoples because of differences among people's environments, not because of biological differences among peoples themselves, end quote. 
This is the claim that he spends most of his 500-page book arguing. Environmental differences between the continents gave Eurasians a massive head start over everyone else in the race toward global domination. What were those differences? And how did they enable Eurasians to develop guns, germs, and steel ahead of everyone else? First, Diamond looks at food. One of the most important events in all of human history is the agricultural revolution, which first occurred around 12 or 13,000 years ago in what is known as the Fertile Crescent, centered in modern-day Iraq along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. This marked a transition from hunting and gathering to settled agriculture, and settled agriculture in turn unleashed a whole host of political and technological changes that led to the rise of civilization. Once settled agriculture was established, people stopped having to move from place to place in search of wild food. They could build permanent shelters, accumulate more goods, and have more children since they no longer had to constantly carry cargo and dependents around. In fact, Diamond makes the argument that people started having many more children, that fertility rates went way up because of their sedentary lifestyles. It was totally impractical to have more more than one child every couple or three years if you were a nomad. Strength in numbers on its own was powerful. But even more importantly, settled agriculture allowed our ancestors to regularly accumulate surpluses of food for the first time, which meant that some people could spend their days doing other things than foraging or hunting. And we know what typically happens next. Society became more stratified, a ruling class emerged to control and distribute surpluses and govern the community. Warrior classes typically emerged in tandem with the ruling class to facilitate that order and maintain security. And craft specialists of all kinds became practical for the first time, enriching and empowering settled agricultural communities with more advanced pottery, metalworking, medicine, engineering, writing, and so forth. This kind of development has tended to happen wherever settled agriculture took root. It takes different forms, but this complexity of society, this increasing stratification and specialization of its members, is pretty typical in history. After a hundred thousand years of living in small nomadic tribal groups, those ancient societies that achieved settled agriculture suddenly embarked on radically more powerful paths of development. But here is the key. Different populations of people around the world had very different environmental resources with which to do this, and those living in the Fertile Crescent in western Eurasia, Diamond argues, had a starkly superior array of useful plants and animals at their disposal. He writes, quote, among the world's thousands of wild grass species, the 56 with the largest seeds, the cream of nature's crop, with seeds at least 10 times heavier than the median grass species, virtually all of them are native to Mediterranean zones or other seasonally dry environments. Furthermore, they are overwhelmingly concentrated in the Fertile Crescent or other parts of western Eurasia's Mediterranean zone, which offered a huge selection to incipient farmers. About 32 of the world's 56 prize wild grasses. In contrast, the Mediterranean zone of Chile offered only two of these species, California and southern Africa just one each, and southwestern Australia none at all. That fact alone goes a long way toward explaining the course of human history. End quote. This is an amazing historical insight, but Diamond's analysis gets even more compelling. He explains that agriculture in the Fertile Crescent grew upon the domestication of eight native crops that remain major sources of food to this day around the world. They've been exported from the Fertile Crescent to many other places, and these include wheat, barley, lentils, peas, chickpeas, and flax, which was critical in making cloth and rope. 
Now, of these, only two, flax and barley, existed in the wild outside of the Fertile Crescent. Clearly, when it came to crops, Eurasians had a significant head start, to say the least. What about animals that were suitable for domestication? Yep, here too, Eurasians hit the jackpot. The wild ancestors of the world's most domesticable animals likewise were spread very unevenly around the world. Diamond identifies 14 species of big mammals that were suitable for domestication and would have been valuable. Animals like sheep, goats, cows, pigs, and horses. Of those 14, South American societies had only one practical option, the llama. While societies of North America, Australia, and Sub-Saharan Africa had none at all. On the other hand, 13 out of the 14 were native to Eurasia, and the Fertile Crescent alone was home to seven, including sheep, goats, cows, pigs, and horses. It might sound surprising that Sub-Saharan Africa didn't have more options, since many of us associate that region with one of the greatest diversities of big mammals anywhere in the world, but none of them are suitable for domestication. Diamond points out that zebras, for example, are too aggressive and unpredictable. Elk and deer panic too easily and can leap 50 feet in a single bound. Makes it pretty hard to control them. Cheetahs just don't breed in captivity. Hippos turn out to be combative juggernauts. Riding a giraffe is comically impossible, and so on. So Eurasians had way more nutritious native crops to grow and way more native animals they could domesticate. What Diamond is arguing is that this exceptional resource endowment rapidly accelerated both the population growth and the development of civilization in Eurasia compared to other continents. But these two advantages, much greater population density and much greater interaction with domesticated animals, led to a third advantage that would make Eurasians especially lethal to societies on other continents. Quote, The major killers of humanity throughout our recent history are infectious diseases that evolved from the diseases of animals. End quote. Smallpox, flu, tuberculosis, malaria, plague, measles, cholera, all appear to have originated among Eurasia's domesticable animals before being transferred to humans. Of course, these zoonotic diseases wreaked havoc on Eurasian societies. Plagues regularly wiped out millions. This isn't in Diamond's book, but... The plague of Justinian, for example, which broke out among Eastern Mediterranean societies between 541 and 542 AD, killed 25 to 50 million people. At its height, something like 5,000 people a day were dying in Constantinople alone. Almost half of that city's population died. In the 1340s, merely a century and a half before Europeans embarked on their exploration of the Americas, another infamous outbreak of plague, known as the Black Death, killed between 75 and 200 million people throughout Eurasia. Half of Europe died. Both plagues were caused by a bacteria called Yersinia pestis, carried by fleas that seem to have originated with rats, gerbils, camels, or other Eurasian mammals. Diamond argues that through millennia of intimate exposure to such diseases, Eurasians developed genetic resistance that societies elsewhere did not. Quote, the importance of lethal microbes in human history is well illustrated by Europeans' conquest and depopulation of the New World. Far more Native Americans died in bed from Eurasian germs than on the battlefield from Eurasian guns and swords. Those germs undermined Indian resistance by killing most Indians and their leaders and by sapping the survivors' morale. End quote. This is a really important part of the story. Eurasian germs were far more lethal than Eurasian guns and steel. 
It's estimated that 95%, 95% of the original population of North and South America died from exposure to Eurasian diseases like smallpox, typhus, and influenza. That's incredible. Now, I'm in my mid-30s, and I grew up being taught that America was a pristine wilderness populated by just a few Native Americans living in harmony with nature. That's completely wrong. Tens of millions of Native Americans once thrived in some of the world's largest cities. For example, one of the biggest and most powerful North American societies was that of the Mississippian civilization of the eastern United States. Millions lived there in sprawling cities. This is now well documented by historians like Charles Mann in his book 1491, New Revelations of the Americas Before Columbus. And yet, between 1492, when Eurasians first began exploring North America, and the 1700s, when they began to actually settle the Mississippi Valley, the Mississippian civilization just disappeared. They all died from epidemics. So actually, those first European explorers of the Mississippi Valley didn't find a pristine wilderness— they found ruins and bones, as far as the eye could see in some cases. This hadn't been well documented, since these remnants largely disintegrated by the time European settlers made it there, two or three hundred years later. Mississippian cities were built of mud and wood, and easily eroded. Overall, then, it was the uneven distribution of food, livestock, and disease that was the ultimate cause for why history unfolded so differently on different continents, according to Jared Diamond. Eurasians won the environmental lottery, and this enabled them to establish civilization much earlier than anyone else and to build more populous and powerful civilizations than anyone else. This set them on track to develop more complicated technology than anyone else, too, according to Diamond. Technology like writing to facilitate resource accounting, commerce and bureaucratic administration, and metallurgy to build the tools and weapons of advanced states. It's a very big-picture view of history— and I think Diamond deserved to win the Pulitzer Prize for illuminating the extent to which variable environmental factors determine the destinies of human societies. However, there are some weaknesses in Diamond's argument, not least of which the manner in which he glosses over technological development. But let's revisit his primary unit of geographical analysis, Eurasia. Comprised of Europe and Asia, it's true that this represents one contiguous landmass, but it's a huge landmass with extreme variations in historical development, which Diamond largely ignores for the sake of his argument. Here's my biggest objection. If you were to go back in time, say a thousand years, you would never guess that one particular society of Eurasia, that of Northwest Europe, would rise to dominate the modern world. Europe was a technological, economic, and political backwater a thousand years ago. No, you would have put your money on China or the Abbasid Caliphate of Arabia. At that time, those were the societies that represented the leading edge of civilization. China was a technological powerhouse, inventing cast iron, the compass, gunpowder, paper, printing, water clocks, and a range of other innovations. The Muslim world under the Abbasid Caliphate was the most cosmopolitan civilization in the world, supporting the most advanced medicine, philosophy, and astronomy. Why didn't China lead the domination of the modern world? Why aren't we speaking Arabic instead of English and Spanish throughout North America? What happened over the past thousand years that caused Europe in general, and Northwest Europe in particular, to undergo such transformative advancements in science, technology, and economics that it suddenly raced past the rest of Eurasian societies and exploded upon the world stage armed with guns, germs, and steel? 
I don't find a satisfactory answer to that question in Jared Diamond's book. To answer that question, we'll have to look elsewhere. And one of the best books to which we can turn was written by an economic historian from Harvard named David Landis, titled The Wealth and Poverty of Nations, Why Some Are So Rich and Some So Poor. That's the book we'll be considering next time, here on Context. I'm Brad Harris. So long.